because this lecture is in the memory of my deceased father i would like to say a few words about my father before i commence my lecture <clears throat> my father was born on 18th of january 1916 no doubt my grandfather was also an advocate and my grandfather it appears i have not seen him was a very good criminal advocate and he used to travel to kolar on his horse to begin with and after some time somewhere in 1933 or 34 my grandfather had imported a car from france and when my father was studying in his pre university my grandfather passed away because insulin had not been synthesized by that time he died even before he was 50 years of age therefore my father had to discontinue his studies immediately after the intermediate and he took pleaders exams immediately thereafter after after uh, uh, completing his intermediate degree and then he enrolled himself as a pleader on 10 7/19/35 and after the advocates act came into force he enrolled himself as an advocate on 3/10/1968 he died on 14/1/1980 my father was not a graduate and he was his education in law was primarily his own study and nothing else my father was an extremely good teacher he had an extremely fine english and his uh, pleadings were very terse in a suit for recovery of money it would actually be a one sentence pleading the defendant has borrowed from the plaintiff a sum of rupees so and so on such and such a date agreeing to repay the same with interest thereon at uh, so and so percent and has executed the subjoined demand promise note and consideration receipt in this behalf this was one sentence second paragraph is if he has paid any money that would be mentioned the third paragraph is calculation the defendant is due in a sum of so and so uh, uh, as per calculations noted here under principal uh interest then uh, deduction then the amount now due and he he would always tell me suppose in fact when i was a student of law he had he he would in when i was in the final year law he asked me to attend the admission court in bangalore every day have a notebook of my own make notes of what 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 was the, what were the points searched before the court and what what was uh, ultimately decided in the case and every week i used to come to chikbalapur he would ask me how you st- uh, what you have understood from uh, the various uh, cases argued before the high court what were the points involved how the matter was presented who was the lawyer who presented it and he would always tell me you should have an ideal lawyer in your mind then only you will grow as a lawyer and not otherwise this in fact when i was uh, in, in the final year law karnataka debt relief act was brought into force in fact from my office with the assistance of another senior in bangalore we had filed 30 40 writ petitions before the honorable high court and there were about 3000 or 4000 writ petitions which were uh, commonly heard uh, uh, which were heard together uh, by the honorable high court in fact uh, m k nambiyar had come down to bangalore to argue that matter in fact i had an occasion to look at that very great uh, legal personality he made a distinction between agricultural indebtedness and agriculture is indebtedness the way in which he presented the uh, the argument was so fine and i was extremely impressed 
with the way he presented the matter before the court. And he said, because of this, the, legis the Karnataka legislature did not have the competence to um, pass a law in regard to the agriculturist indebtedness, and it could only pass law in regard to an agricultural indebtedness. In fact, I had the occasion of watching M.C. Chagala before, uh, when he had come to Bangalore for arguing a matter. I have seen Tanguti Krishnarao, who was an advocate general in Bangalore. I have seen Sundar Swami arguing number of matters before this court. I, in fact, even before I became a lawyer, I had an occasion of looking at very great lawyers, the way they presented, the way they, uh, they tried to take an adjournment when the court was completely against them and try to start from an absolutely different angle when uh, uh, in the next date of hearing. So therefore, in fact, my father would always tell me whenever I had a problem, whenever I approached my father with a problem, he would always tell me, don't ask me a solution for your problem. You still, you make an independent study of yourself. If you reach a dead end, you tell me how to proceed. I will uh, uh, guide you from how to proceed on those lines. If ultimately the court should ask you, what is the authority for this position of law? You should be able to point out a particular section or an authority. You cannot say my father has told me and my father is an author. Your father is not an authority for any proposition. And one other thing he would always tell me was, you should always stand before the court when you argue a matter. You, you, you must, your tone must be in such a way that you should always be able, be able to drive home to the judge that this is the correct point of law and you should decide in accordance uh, uh, with the law that is in force. He would uh, always say, don't go near the court, whisper or cringe before the court for orders. Never mislead the court. And if by any chance such an occasion had arisen, you should immediately make a submission to the court and own your mistake. You should always be very fair uh, to your opponent, very submissive to the judge. And your conduct must be exemplary in court. Apart from that, as far as clients' monies were concerned, he had kept a very good record of what money he received during, the, during his entire career of, uh, as a lawyer. In fact, we would receive in a injunction suit a, uh, the, um, three, um, three rupees 75 paisa as refund. In fact, that would be entered in a register. That 375 paisa would go to a particular account. When the client came, money would be given to him generally by check and the client would endorse in this register. I have got those gold registers with me. He, in fact, as a lawyer, how a person must be honest, how a person must uh, conduct himself as a lawyer, my father, according to me, was exemplary. And if I have gained some reputation as a lawyer, it is my father who has trained me and he has been responsible for all this. Therefore, and there was my father's brother, D.S. Lakshman Rao, was also an advocate. In fact, I have learned boldness as an advocate from my uncle's D.S. Lakshman Rao. In fact, after I became, immediately after I became a lawyer, there was an occasion in which we had to move for an order of temporary injunction before the vacation court. In fact, I went with my uncle. In fact, we had filed the papers in the morning. The matter had to come before the, the judge had to take up the matter at three o'clock before the court. Four o'clock, he didn't come to the court. 4.15, he did not come to the court. Then, do you know what my uncle did? He said, come on, we'll go into the chambers. Both of us went into the chambers. The judge 
was upset. <coughs> he asked in a loud voice, Mr. Lakshman Rao, why did you come into my chambers without my permission? Then my uncle said, Mr. So-and-so, you are expected to be in court at 3 o'clock. I just came here to find out what better business you had in the chambers than coming to court and attending to the court work at 3 o'clock. This, is, this, this was all my intention. There was nothing else. The judge was taken aback. He asked my uncle to sit down. He got the papers. He heard my uncle and passed suitable orders in this case. So in, my father always said, whenever you feel a particular argument is right, don't feel shy to present that argument before the court. You present that argument in the best way possible. If you are wrong, your opponent will point out that you are wrong. The judge will say that you are wrong and that will be an education. If your argument is accepted, you will gain confidence and you will be able to present the matter uh, very well in your subsequent uh, arguments. Therefore, I can never forget my father. Every paper I touch every day, I remember my father. Whenever I remember him, tears always roll down from my, eye, uh, from my eyes. If I have the ability to talk to you today, it is my father's strength and not my strength. I bow my head in great obeisance to my father and I, 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 I have no words to say what I feel about my father because when the heart is full, the tongue is tied and I cannot say anything more about him uh, as a lawyer and nothing else. Now, I come to the subject on hand. The subject on hand is whether the daughter of a co-parsoner would acquire right by birth in the property of his mother who has a share in the co-parsonary properties. In fact, this question was posed before the court in a decision rendered by the Karnataka High Court in regular first appeal number 100238 bar 2017, Shivagangava alias Parvatava versus Mahadeva Pa Fakirapa Shingli. This judgment was rendered on 15th of December 2022 by a division bench consisting of Justice Suraj Govindaraj and G. Basavaraj. In, in fact, in order to understand what was the ultimate decision in this, in this case, we have got to first understand the facts of this case little carefully and then try to understand the law analyzed in this particular decision. Then this Virabhadrapa, one Virabhadrapa was the prepositor. Virabhadrapa had three sons. The first son was Fakirappa, the second son was Mallappa, the third son was Gundappa. In fact, the Fakirappa, the first son, died on 27-7-1955. Mallappa died on 2-1-77. Gundappa died, the date of death is not available from the judgment, he died subsequent to Mallappa. The properties originally belonged to Virabhadrappa, the father, and therefore, on the death of Virabhadrappa, the property was acquired by his three sons in equal shares, each one getting a one-third share in these properties. Then this Mallappa, the, in fact, if the judgment is carefully looked into, you, you, a reference may be made to page 5, paragraph 5.1, wherein 
by while making a reference to the facts this is what is stated there is a partition between fakirappa mallappa and gundappa in persians of which mutation entries were made so therefore in paragraph 51 you will find that a partition was effected between the three sons when they were alive now a reference may be made to paragraph 16 of the judgment if we should go to paragraph 16 of this judgment this is what is stated in paragraph 16 in the present case admittedly there being a partition between nilavva and defendants 1 to 4 one third share of mallappa came to nilavva in fact here it says there being a partition between nilavva and defendants 1 to 4 defendants 1 to 1 uh, 1 to 4 they were the heirs of the first son and the last son that is fakir of pass sons were d1 d2 and d3 gundappa son was d4 so therefore the partition according to paragraph 16 was not be between the three sons they were between the children of these three sons as stated in paragraph 16 the date of the partition is not also available from the judgment then what happened was after the death of mallappa whatever properties that were allotted to mallappa they were succeeded by his only daughter nilava and this nilava has sold these properties under three documents exhibits d1 d2 and d3 to defendants 1 2 and 4 in the year 1992 so therefore nilavva sold the properties in the year 1992 then the after the uh, then this the, there are two children nilavva's children versus shivagangavva and girijavva these two people that is the uh, mallappa's daughter is nilavva nilavva's daughters are the plaintiffs they filed a suit for partition saying that we have a right by birth in the properties of our mother nilava and therefore the sales affected by nilava in favor of defendants 1 2 and 4 in the year 1992 did not bind us and therefore we are entitled to our share in the property that belonged to her, our, our mother uh, mother nilava so therefore the question was this matter came up before the uh, high court for decision in the month of december 22 when act 39 bar 2005 had already come into force therefore the argument before the supreme court before the high court was that we had derived a right by birth in the properties of our mother who had inherited those properties from her father and therefore these properties were proportionally properties in the hands of our mother and therefore the mother herself could not sell these properties without reference to us we are not parties to the sale deed therefore we are entitled to a partition and separate possession so therefore the question was whether the daughters of a female co-partners derived a right by birth in the co-partnery properties by virtue of act 39 bar 2005 that was the primary question involved in this case before going to what the high court has decided in this matter i would like to invite your attention to section 14 and section 6 of the hindu succession act in fact 
if section 14 is carefully read, this is what section 14 says in its terms. <laughs> Section 14.1 is what is relevant for us for the present purpose. Any property possessed by a female Hindu, whether acquired before or after the commencement of the act, shall be held by her as full owner thereof and not as a limited owner. So therefore, whatever property she acquired, the acquisition may be either before the act or after the act. That property would belong to the female exclusively and, and it would not be, uh, her, her uh, title would not be that of a limited owner because the old Hindu law only gave the, uh, the women a, right, a limited estate in these properties for enjoying these properties. Then, an explanation is added to section 14.1. In fact, this explanation actually uh, enlarges the scope of section 14.1. In this section, property includes both movable and immovable property acquired by a female Hindu by inheritance or device or a partition or in lieu of maintenance, arrears of maintenance, or by gift from any person, whether a relative or not, before, at, or after marriage, or any other manner whatsoever. This is what is important. So any other manner whatsoever, and also any such property held by her as Tridana immediately before the commencement of the act. So therefore, whatever way the female could have acquired the property, she becomes the absolute owner of the property. So therefore, there was no limitation at all under section 14 with regard to the acquisition of the property by a female. Whatever property she acquired before the act would enlarge into a full estate whatever property she acquired thereafter would belong to her absolutely. Then section 2 created a small exception to section subsection 1. This is how subsection 2 reads, notwithstanding anything contained in, not, not, nothing contained, I am sorry, nothing contained in subsection 1 shall apply to any property acquired by way of a gift or under a will or any other instrument or under a will or other instrument or the decree, order or award prescribe a restricted estate in such property. So therefore, if by a will, a gift or a decree, a restricted estate is given to a female. If a restricted estate is given to a female, in such situations, they say that the property would not enlarge into a full estate and she would have enjoyed only a restricted estate. In fact, if we should make a review of all the authorities rendered by the Supreme Court, in some cases, the Supreme Court in earlier decision has stated that this restricted estate is in recognition of her antecedent right. Then the proper, the, the, the estate would enlarge into a fully estate. In fact, the latter decisions practically have taken a view that if there is a clear recital in the document with regard to a restricted estate, then that estate would not enlarge into a full estate. I, I don't uh, try to go into those decisions and say how uh, the, a distinction can be made between the old and the new decisions, because that is not very relevant for the present purpose. Then we have got to make 
a, a reference uh, to two decisions of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, while uh, trying to interpret section 14 in the widest sense possible, has rendered a decision in 2009, SAR Civil 728, Gangamma versus G. Nagaratnamma. This was a case arising from the Karnataka High Court. This was a case of, part, this was a suit for partition filed by the wife of a deceased co pastor who was the daughter in law of the family against the mother in law and others. One of the properties that was the subject matter of the suit was acquired in the name of the mother in law. What happened in, in that suit was, I would only make a reference to paragraph 11 of the judgment, where their lordships have said, in, this, in, the, in the first appeal, this is what happened in the first appeal. In the first appeal, the high court found that no evidence was adduced by the appellant to show that she had any independent source of income. It has also come in evidence that at the time of death of the husband of the appellant, only G. Srinivas was 16 years old and the other children of the appellant were minors and they had no income. The High Court found that evidence was adduced to show that the husband of the plaintiff had substantial income and he owned an ambassador car. In view of this evidence, the High Court held that properties at items one and two are joint family properties. So this was the conclusion of the High Court. Then the argument that was put before the High Court was the learned counsel for the appellant contended that without any evidence, the High Court came to a finding that the husband of plaintiff number one uh, had substantial income. From the list of documentary evidence produced before the trial court, nothing appears on record to indicate that there was any document uh, evidencing the income of the husband of plaintiff number one. Therefore, the high court fell into an error that though the properties at items one and two are recorded in the name of the appellant, they are joint family properties. So this was the argument put. The Supreme Court did not go into the question of finding out whether the mother-in-law had any income or not. The Supreme Court said, look at section 14, one. If section 14, one is looked into, if the property is registered in the name of the female, the property belongs to the female absolutely. In fact, this is how the Supreme Court has put it at paragraph 14 of the judgment. Section 14, one of the Hindu Succession Act has a bearing on the issue as the properties at item number one are recorded in the name of the appellant. In the absence of any evidence to the contrary in this case, the appellant, by operation of section 14, one of the said act, is the full owner of those properties. In, in the facts of this case discussed above, it has to be accepted that these properties are not uh, joint properties, but the appellant is the sole owner of these properties. They said the property is registered in the name of the mother. By application of section 14, one, the property belongs uh, to her absolutely. Then they make a reference to a four or five earlier decisions of the Supreme Court. And they ultimately conclude at paragraph 19 of the judgment as follows. In view of such consistent view taken by this court on interpretation of section 14, we hold that section 14, one of the said act would apply in respect of the properties which stand in the name of the appellant and the appellate would be the full owner of these properties, and therefore the appeal was ultimately allowed. So therefore, 
this section, this, this decision practically lays down that section where property is purchased in the name of a female, irrespective of the fact whether such property was purchased with the aid of joint family funds or not, the property would be the separate property of the female and it cannot be subject to partition by in a suit for partition of the joint family properties. Now, in fact, there was there is one other case of the Karnataka High Court where this question has been put at rest by Justice Budihal. In a decision reported in 2015, one Karnataka Law Journal, page 698. In fact, a reference may be made to paragraph end of paragraph 11 of the judgment. This is what uh, this High Court has said. Even if it is presumed that the joint family by investing its funds has purchased a property in the name of a female member of the family, such property becomes the absolute property of the female member and the other members of the family have no right to ask such female member to put the property into the common hotspot seeking partition in respect of the property between the members of the family. This legal aspect has been completely overlooked by, by, uh, by both the courts below and the High Court has ultimately allowed the appeal. So therefore, these two decisions have completely uh, uh, ruled that there is no scope for argument at all where the property is purchased by a female with whatever money uh, it could be, the property would be her property by operation of section 14.1. In fact, that principle is also affirmed by the Karnataka High Court in the decision that is uh, uh, rendered in this case. A reference may be made to paragraph 12. In fact, section 14 is referred to in paragraph 14 of the judgment. Section 15 refers to the explanation made in paragraph 15. And the word partition is also used in, in the explanation. And therefore, the court says that the property is acquired by Nilamma under a partition. And therefore, the property is her uh, exclusive property. I refer to paragraph 16 and 17. In the present case, admittedly, there being a partition between Nilamma and defendants one to four, one third share of Malamma came to Nilava. That is, that is to say that the acquisition of title of Nilava was under a partition which was recorded in the mutation entry. In fact, as, as I have already drawn your uh, attention, in paragraph five, it is stated that the partition was between the three sons of Birabhadarpa. Whereas here it is stated that the partition was between the children of all the three brothers. Now, be it as, as it may, look at it from any angle. The properties stood in the name of Nilava and irrespective of the, irrespective of the manner of acquisition, in terms of section 14 of the Hindu Succession Act, the said property becomes her absolute property. There being three registered sale deeds dated 11-12-92 and 31-12-91 as per exhibits D1, D2 and D3 and Nilava having, uh, uh, Nilava having sold her absolute property over which she had absolute interest, no one can question the said sale. 
the contention of the plaintiff that Nilawa could not have sold the property since there was no family necessity. Once a female Hindu gets an independent right to the property, for sale of such property, there is no justification of family necessity or otherwise, which is required to be given by a Hindu female. So this is one ground on which the claim for the appellant was rejected. Then the court has looked into section 6 clause 1 of the amended act. This is how section 6 clause 1 reads. In fact, no, sir. that is I read proviso to section 6. So a daughter becomes a co-personer by birth by virtue of the amendment in the year 2005. And this is what proviso to subsection 1 says, provided that nothing contained in, sub, in this subsection shall affect, not that, I, I am sorry, one minute. <coughs> that is, I make a reference to subsection 2, subsection 2, a property to which a female Hindu becomes entitled by virtue of subsection 1, that is, as a co-personal to which she became, becomes entitled to, shall be held by her with the incidents of co ownership and shall be regarded notwithstanding anything contained in this act or any other law for the time being in force as property capable of being disposed of by her by testamentary succession. So therefore, the court says that whatever property she got as a co partner could be disposed of by her by executing a will or a testamentary disposition. In interpreting this particular uh, su su subsection 2, in the reading conjointly with subsection 14, the High Court has said that even when a female receives some property by birth, by virtue of being a co partner under the amended uh, section of the Hindu succession, amended section 6 of the Hindu succession act in 2005, such property would belong to her absolutely. If that property did not belong to her absolutely, the statute would not have said that she could dispose of that property absolutely by testamentary succession. So therefore, two grounds are uh, sustained in this case for dismissing the appeal. First is under section 14. And second is, even if the property is co property of the mother, the daughters could not claim a share by birth in these properties because under section 6 sub clause 2, the property was capable of being disposed of by the mother by execution of a will. And therefore, it was her absolute property. Therefore, she has sold the property and this cannot be questioned. Then, the court has gone into, after in fact, a further question in the case, though according to me, it was not necessary for determining the subpoena. The court has said that if a male Hindu secures some properties as a co partner by birth, then his right to alienate is conditioned by either family necessity or uh, necessity or uh, or uh, 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 benefit of the family. Therefore, as far as where, where a female gets this property, this restriction is not there. But where a male gets this property, the male is subject to this restriction. Therefore, actually, by this amendment, the, the rights of the female co partner would be on a higher footing than a male co partner and they have said that this is a matter for concern and therefore 
the legislature will have got to look into this uh, question and then solve this by a legislative amendment. That's what the court has said. Now, I would uh, look at this case from one other angle also, that is, which has not been uh, uh, explained in the judgment. See, the Supreme Court has in two decisions stated that where property is acquired by a Hindu male at a partition subsequent to 1956, the property would partake the character of self-acquired properties and it would lose this, its character as co properties. In fact, the two decisions to which I would like to make a reference are Harri or Roy versus Shakuntala Devi, 2008 Supreme Court cases, page 46. This is what the, uh, the court has said in that particular judgment. Once the share of a co is de determined, it ceases to be co property. So even uh, uh, if by some means, even if there is a partition, uh, or division of status also, when once the co right is determined, it ceases to be co property. The parties in such event does not possess the property as joint tenants, but as tenants in common. That is by making a reference to section 19 of the Hindu Succession Act. The decision of this court in the SBI Therefore, he is not applicable to the present case, where a co-personal takes, this is what is important, where a co-personal takes definite share in the property, he is the owner of that share, and as such, he cannot alienate the same by sale or mark, he, but he can, I'm sorry, he can alienate the same by sale, market, in the same manner as he can dispose of his self-acquired property. So where the property is acquired at a partition, the property loses the character of being co personary property. The property becomes the self-acquired property of the persons to whom the properties are allotted. In fact, this decision of the Supreme Court in the year 2008 is affirmed by another recent decision of the Supreme Court, reported in 2020, SAR Civil, page 127. The same, uh, this uh, Hardy or Rice case has been referred to. This passage has been quoted with uh, uh, approval. And therefore, see, in this case, if Virabhadrappa Sarsan some said partitioned the property, what happened? Virabhadrappa Sarsan, Mallappa gets this property as self-acquired property. If the property and he is the sole surviving co-personer, so when once he is the sole surviving co-personer, on his death, the proper, in, in, in year 1977, much before the 2005 Act, the property devolved upon Nilava under Section 8. Therefore, Nil, it was Nilava's self-acquired property. If it was Nilava's self-acquired property, then uh, the, uh, she could dispose of the properties in any manner he, she wanted. And therefore, his the daughters could not claim a share in these properties. The, the appeal could have been disposed of on this ground also. There is also the another ground on which the appeal could have been disposed of. That is, the dates on which the alienations are made. The alienations are made and exhibit D1, D2, and D3 in the year 1992. Therefore, all alienations made prior to 2004, particular date, 39, 9, uh, 2000, particular date in 2004, they are saved under the proviso to subsection 1. Therefore, even if we think that the property is copastery property in the hands of Nilava, Nilava had sold these properties prior to 2004 in the year 91 and 92. And in view of the sales having been made before the cutoff date, the sales are valid 
and the daughters could not climb any share in these properties. And sometimes we make a mistake. As far as Karnataka is concerned, there is one principle which we have got to keep clearly in mind. That is, the manager of a joint family could alienate the properties for legal necessity or family benefit only in cases where the alienations are made during the minority of the other co-partners. So if all the other co-partners are majors, even if the sale is for legal necessity or family benefit, it does not bind the major co-partners. Only when there are minor co-partners and the karta alienates the properties, <coughs> then the question would arise whether the sale is for legal necessity or family benefit. Therefore, this, in fact, in many decisions, these distinctions are not uh, very clearly kept in mind. In fact, the earlier, there is one decision of the Karnataka High Court that is the earliest decision reported in ILR 1953 Mysore, page 49. In fact, they have said, they have very clearly said that when there are adult co partners, legal necessity is not a substitute for consent. This is a bench decision. And uh, this is what uh, the High Court has said uh, I, uh, at page 50. <laughs> the right which a member of the joint family gets by birth cannot be defeated except by consent expressed or implied to, to an alienation made by the manager of the family. Legal necessity is a substitute for such consent only when on account of the minority or other reason the co partner is unable to give such a consent as stated in Midakshara. An alienation by the manager of joint family for legal necessity without the express or implied consent of the other co partners does not affect their rights. So, therefore, if there are major co partners, even if the sale is for family benefit or necessity, the adult co partners are not bound. Their claim for partition has got to be allowed. In fact, this principle is also affirmed by another decision of the Karnataka High Court rendered in 2014, uh, four cases here, page 3611. It's a judgment of Justice A.V. Chandrasekhar, which, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, I, I make a reference to one sentence in paragraph seven of the judgment. From the records, it is evident that there is no serious dispute about the facts that the property in question is the ancestral property of defendant number one. Though defendant number one is manager of the joint family, he has sold the entire family property, though he has a limited share. Where there are major members in the family, this is what is important, where there are major members in the family. The karta is not entitled to alienate the undivided share of the major members. Karta of joint family is entitled to alienate the undivided share of the minor co-partners if there is legal necessity for the family or pressure on the estate of the joint family. In fact, in many cases, this principle has not been uh, properly appreciated. And therefore, I thought fit that this principle also should be uh, kept in mind. So therefore, uh, see the, the decision under consideration has puts, now puts a complete seal on, on the question. If the property is purchased in the name of a female member, finish. Nobody can claim a right in those properties as joint family properties. We should always advise our clients that he cannot claim a share 
in the property which is acquired in the name of a female member. So this is all what I could uh, uh, say, analyze about the judgment that is recently passed by the Honorable High Court. I thank you all for having given me a patient hearing and uh, uh, Mr. Basaraj for having given me an opportunity to share a few words about my father who was my guru and teacher. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Basaraj, I finished. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I finished. Okay, sir. Now, can you see section 30, sir? This is one problem the, the others other pointed in out. In fact, yes, see, even in the decision, I, I will, I will first read section 30. The reference first. section? So, yes, yes. Section, section 30, I will read section 30. and 30, 30 language is same. Hmm. Ah, yes. <laughs> in fact, Yes, sir. See, I would even say yes, sir. that if uh, section, uh, subsection 2 of section 6 is looked into, yes, sir. this is what it says, any property which a, which a female Hindu becomes entitled to by virtue of subsection 1. See, yes, the sir. word entitled has a different meaning altogether. I will give you this illustration. A female has well, yeah, uh, she acquires certain properties from her father. Let yes. us say that she has two daughters. Yes, sir. So if she acquires the property from her father, yes, sir. she gets a one-third share and the two daughters also get a one-third share each. Yes, sir. Therefore, the reference to becomes entitled to would be yes, that this subsection two would apply only to her one-third share and not to the one-third share of our daughters. Yes. If this section is kept. So therefore, the word entitled has a specific meaning. See, when once she has two daughters, though the whole property is allotted to her, the property is allotted to her branch. If the two daughters are alive, on the date when she is allotted, to a, allotted a share, those two daughters also get a right by birth. And they are also entitled to a one-third share. To say, under subsection 2, that the entire property given to the mother would uh, be capable of disposing of by testamentary succession, in my view, may not be fully justified. And that's, this that, may... that's what the legislature says. Anyway, in conjunction with 14, uh -huh. I think the, the High Court has only done an excellent job. Otherwise, there will be an avalanche uh -huh. of uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Certainly, certainly. In fact, I, 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 read, I read section, any Hindu may dispose of by will or other testamentary disposition, any property which is capable of being so disposed of by him or her in accordance with the provisions of the Indian Succession Act or any other law for the time being in force and applicable to Hindus. The interest of a male Hindu in Mithaksara Kopas very property. In fact, here the interest of a okay. see whatever rights the male has, the female has also the same rights, isn't it? If the male Hindu can dispose of his interest in the property, the female Hindu also can dispose of her, her interest in the property. Therefore, by and it would be depriving. The granddaughters of a share, the purpose of the enactment is to give a daughter a right by birth. Therefore, uh, what I would say is, you should read down section 14. You, you should read down section 14 and say that the testamentary capacity of the female co partner should be equivalent to the testamentary capacity of a male Hindu. Read section 6. 14, section 30, apply the uh, rule that the amendment was primarily bent for protecting the uh, rights of the female. And therefore, by reading down section 14 partially in conjunction with section 6 and 13, we could possibly interpret that the uh, read down section uh, 
to and say that it applies only to the interest of the female and not the interest of her daughters. This interpretation is also possible. And this is how I look at the entire matter. That's all what I could say. Now, I'll open the uh, seminar for question and answer session. Of course, this, uh, this will be uh, open to different interpretation uh, by individual advocate. But this is the law declared by the Honorable High Court as in today. But according to me, this would at least prevent the avalanche of, avalanche of litigations that would be you know, powering into the courts. Because even as in today, because of the amendment to section 6, the courts are flooded with uh, litigations. Now, the second round of litigations by the children would be something beyond our uh, comprehension. And one um, message which I can read is uh, that the legislature has consciously used the word daughter and not granddaughter, uh, etc. Uh, that might not be necessary, but uh, if you say daughter not natural and if the intention is to continue the co-personary system, mere reference to daughter would have been enough. So therefore, uh, that I do not think that makes any difference. So uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. The audience can unmute themselves and ask the questions. I opened the uh, option to unmute yourself and ask the questions. You can ask the questions if you have any doubts. Kindly repeat. First Supreme Court judgment, sir. These are the first Supreme Court judgment is, yes. that is, 2009, SAR Civil 728, that is, uh, uh, Gangamma versus G. Nagaratnama. In fact, the two, these two decisions which I made a reference, they are not referred to in uh, the latest judgment of uh, the Karnataka High Court. Current guy could handle Mr. Justice Suraj Govindras and G. Basuraj very recently you have told, sir. Please repeat. Yeah. yeah, that's what we are that, discussing. That, that, I, that is uh, RFA 100238 of 2017 the, disposed of on 15th December 22. That RFA, is, one. RSA 100238 bar 2017. Shiva Gangava alias Parvatava versus Mahadevappa Fakirappa Shingli. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I think the Mr. Prashant, sir. Uh, sir Sunan Rao, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Your narration is very clear. There are no questions. In fact, I wanted to just confirm myself. In respect of male co partners, it is two way. Both to it can receive, it that also has to be uh, continued further. Disposition also it applies, co personary. But in case of female, it is only to receive and not to right. dispose of. Am right. I right, sir? Right. That's a conclusion. Right, right. It's only right, one right. way. Right, right, right. Secondly, right. under 14.1, section 14.1 of the HS Act, the starting word is any acquisition, any property. Right. And later it says because of section six. Mm. Ah, because of section six. Secondly, it says that in any other manner whatsoever. I think that's a clinching. That, that, uh, yes, that is yes, yes. Correct. That, that completely widens correct. the nature of acquisition. Correct. Mm. So nothing else can come in that. Right, 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 right. right. And Thank section you, 14. Thank you. Thank you. 14 was not a one-time arrangement. Correct. So what it's like a whatever comes in <clears throat> to the kitty of the uh, woman would naturally come within the fold of section 14. It was not a one-time arrangement according to me. It would be a continuous perennial source according to me. Correct. Can be. But, but just uh, out of even, curious, please, sir, please, sir. Uh, you, know, you see, if you look at the earlier decisions, they say even when a restricted <clears throat> estate is given, if it is in recognition of a right to maintenance uh, or something like uh, of a pre-existing right, then they say even such property also would enlarge. Yes. So therefore, there is a lot of scope for uh, 
interpretation even in cases where a limited uh, estate is given under a will or a gift okay. sir just out of curiosity i'm asking hmm. the, the the sales have been made sometime in 91 and 92 in this case yeah, yeah, case yeah had it been after say 2006 hmm. would it have made any difference sir you see if the other two uh, uh, if the other arguments are upheld it becomes irrelevant mm. the date of sale would be irrelevant 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 so i said that that was also one of the grounds Fact on which uh, the uh, claim could be negative that's all what Correct. i said right it was not uh, uh, a relevant. question which deserved it which deserved a determination in the case thank you sir thank you an authoritative judgment was very badly required because uh, I did not come across any judgment of any other high court on this point. And whenever I go to the local bar uh, and raise this topic of section six, they would invariably ask uh, what is the effect of allotment of share to the women, whether the children will get a right, etc. Perhaps the first judgment uh, is by the trial court Bangalore, which dismissed the suit filed by the daughter uh, invoking section 14 of the Indo Succession Act. That is by the trial court. The matter was pending before the high court. I don't know. Uh, I think that would be covered by the judgment of the division bench. Uh, the first of its kind judgment was delivered by, delivered by the trial court, invoking section 14 and dismissing the suit filed by the daughter, claiming the property allotted to the mother under section 6 of the act, amended section 6. Now, In fact, uh, no. basing my argument on section 14 and the two decisions which I made a reference, I have secured number of dismissals in respect of properties acquired in the Nevada period. <laughs> so, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Karnataka Rajya Vakilara Parishattu, Mathu KSBC Law Academy Paravagi, Indi Na Upanyasa Nidhi Danta Sri SR Surenara Andrao Hiriya Vakilaru, Varige Dhanyavadagala Narpishtai Dene, Matamme Upanyasa Karakramadalli, Inondu, Ati Mukiva, the Vishavana, the Gurkondo, Matta Petiagona, Alevergu, Danima de Gulu, Shubasanji.